one. Um, thank you so much for joining today. Um, I am joined by all of our wonderful colleagues at the DRC, also known as the Data and Research Center. And um, today we will be going through the All of Us Research Platform, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as well as um, going through some of our data protections and understanding a little bit more about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and how you can use it on our platform. Um, so I, with that, I'm going to share my screen. All right. So before we start, I just wanted to say a, a huge thank you to all the participants um, who have generously donated their data to all of us. Um, we could not do any of the research we hope to enable without them um, and also our community partners who make all of this work possible. Additionally, um, we like to thank our consortium members um, it takes a village to really put all of this together. And we're really thankful to all the people on this screen um, for their help uh, with, uh, with our platform and uh, with curating the data um, and getting the data to all of you who are on this call. So today's agenda and objectives uh, we went over this a little bit, but more in detail, we are going to introduce the All of Us Research Program, our database and um, the computing environment. We're also going to describe our privacy and security protections. We'll take a break and take any questions you may have. Um, we'll also then uh, showcase an example of health disparities research using machine learning and artificial intelligence um, on our platform. So a couple of housekeeping items. Um, feel free to use the Q&A function to ask any questions that you have during the presentation. Um, in addition to Lena, Brad, and myself, we are also joined by other colleagues at the DRC who are ready to answer your questions. Um, and additionally, when you do get a copy of our uh, slide deck, you will have uh, you will see that there are texts that are underlined um, and these have links embedded in them. So it makes it easier for you to travel to some of the, uh, travel to some of the, the links um, and revisit some of the information that we talked to you about during this presentation. All right, so uh, what is the All of Us Research Program? So the mission of the All of Us Research Program is the acceleration of medical breakthroughs. And the program is working toward advancing precision medicine for everyone. Our goal is to have at least 1 million participants. Importantly, diversity is at the heart of the research program. And our data includes a diverse population of participants, especially those who have been underrepresented in biomedical research. So when it comes to the data sets themselves, they are longitudinal, including our surveys. We're looking at delivering one of the largest biomedical data sets um, that's easy and free to access for researchers and provides transparency for participants. So now that you've learned a little bit about our program and our amazing participants, let's take a look at the data and how we curate them. So we currently offer many data types, including surveys, electronic health records, phys physical measurements, wearables, and genomics. And additionally, in the future, we are going to have biospecimens and um, that will be forthcoming. We're also really excited about uh, the launch of some new and interesting surveys. So we have our social determinants of health. You can see our infographics here of the kinds of questions and survey items that are included. Um, and also our minute surveys, which gives more information about uh, participants 
uh, COVID vaccination experiences. So how diverse are our data? So you can see our, um, our stats here, but when it comes to underrepresented in biomedical research categories, um, we have 78% come from at least one category of underrepresented in biomedical research, 47% non-white or Hispanic Latino ethnicity, 29% 65 years or older, 10% less than a GED, 27% uh, less than or equal to $25,000 a year in, in terms of annual income, and 13% sexual and gender minorities. And we have a tiered approach to data access. So um, there's something for everyone, basically. We have a public tier. You don't need to be a researcher, a registered researcher with us to use the public tier. It is open to anyone. And that public tier is aggregate data. And for uh, privacy, participant counts are rounded up to 20 in instances where the total number of participants is small. And anyone can look at these data by using our data browser tool. And we'll go more into what that looks like um, in a little bit. Next up, we have our registered tier, and this has participant level data. It exceeds HIPAA standards. Um, and here, all dates are shifted backwards by a random number between one and 365. And this shift is constant for each record. So temporality of events is preserved. Researchers must register and be approved to access these data through our researcher workbench. We also have a control tier. And for the control tier, it features our genomic data and more granular data from the research, uh, the register tier, such as the first three digits of a participant's zip code and unshifted event dates. And again, as I said before, longer term, we will have biospecimens, but we also plan to add ancillary studies um, as well. So what is the difference between the register tier and the control tier? So generally speaking, the control tier includes all data types available in our register tier, but at a more granular scale. Um, for example, event dates are unshifted. Our control tier also includes data types not available in the register tier, and that is namely genomic data. So now we're gonna talk about our research hub, which is really the first step into getting to know all of us. Um, again, um, our, my colleagues will put some links in the chat. So feel free to use those links while this presentation is um, going on. So you can visit uh, our public website called the research hub at www.researchallofus.org. And here's where you'll find many of our public tools um, that anyone can use, researchers, participants, uh, anyone can use and, and look at what we have going on at the All of Us Research Program. So I will talk about three tools briefly and then we'll go into um, the data browser tool um, more extensively. So we have a data snapshots tool. This tool is where you can see where we are on our journey to a million participants. Um, it also shows what states, um, you know, most of our participants are coming from. So it's a really good way to get an overall picture of how we're doing with enrollment. We also have a survey explorer tool. And this survey explorer tool will show you all the different surveys that we have available. They will show you the questions that we asked in that survey um, in English as well as in Spanish. It will also show you where we get our survey questions from. So if there's source material, um, more like validated uh, surveys that these questions come from, it will show you what uh, surveys our questions come from 
or if they are unique to us, the questions that we're just asking, um, it will also show you that. Lastly, uh, we have our research projects directory. And that is where you can see all the active ongoing projects that people are using um, all of us research data for. So you can look and see, uh, you can type in different um, diseases or conditions or um, anything that you're interested in to see what people are doing. You can also, uh, if you find something that you feel is stigmatizing or you have questions about, you can raise those to us there as well um, for us to take a look at. So we have uh, our data browser tool, and this is the one that we're going to go more in detail with because it is a great tool for thinking about hypothesis generation or just thinking about um, what kinds of things you might be interested in before you even decide to uh, become a registered user. So um, this is the landing page for the data browser tool. And you can see that it lists all the different data types that we have, as well as how many participants um, data would fall into um, that particular um, domain. So let's say we're interested in asthma. Like we, we our, ma our main study is on asthma and we wanna see, okay, what kinds of data does all of us research program have when it comes to asthma. So you would type in asthma and you will see that we have um, EHR data, which is electronic health records. We have con um, conditions and procedures. We also have survey questions under personal medical history and family medical history. So let's say we're interested in conditions um, in the EHR records. So we would click on conditions and then you will get even more information. So of course, there are different types of asthma. Um, I've listed here three, there are more um, that would come up and populate if you, you typed in asthma. Um, but you, um, for example, if we're interested in mild intermittent asthma, we can click on that. And that is gonna lead to a drop down menu where you can see the distribution of participants, whether they are um, or whether you want to see that by age or sex assigned at birth. And that gives you a really good um, estimation of, you know, if I'm an asthma researcher and uh, I want to see how many people, what kind of age group I'm interested in, is this a resource that I could use to answer my particular research question? So in the, in the chat or in the, the um, I guess maybe probably in the chat, if you have thoughts on different kinds of data that you're interested in, feel free to, to type that in there. We'd love to see what you're interested in. Feel free to use the data browser during this time to um, explore. And um, if you have questions about the different types of data that we have, please make sure to ask that in the question and answer section. So um, how to register. So when you go on to our website and you click on register, you will get this page about how to register. The first step is really to learn about all of us and our data. And you've done that already. Um, and you're doing that now while you're looking at the data browser. Um, the second step would be for your institution to have an agreement with us. Currently, only researchers from institutions, uh, US-based institutions that are nonprofits, healthcare organizations, um, profits, nonprofits, healthcare organizations, or academic institutions can have a, a researcher or, or registration agreement with us. Um, we are expanding that in the future. I know that we got some questions already about um, if what if this doesn't apply to me. Um, in the future, we will be expanding that. Um, but if you are, if you do fall into one of those categories, chances are you, your institution might already be affiliated with us. 
which would mean you would click the link under step two, and that will take you to this page. Um, and you can type in your institution and see if there is already an agreement with us and what level of access you already have. Uh, once you do that, uh, if you already have an agreement with us, you can move on to the last steps, um, which will take about two hours to complete if your institution does not have a data use and, a, and registration agreement with us, there is a link for you to use in order to start that process. If you need help with uh, registration, um, we do have a, a way for us to help you along the way. You would just simply go to help and there will be a window that pops up you would want to select login.gov registration assistance that will give you a form and we can help you um, in that process. So why register? So there are many benefits to registering with all of us. Um, you know, we have our platform, we have our tools, and we have $300 in initial um, computing credit that we give to all users, um, all new users. And we have user support materials and staff, myself and all the people here who are, would love to help in any way that we can. We also have opportunities to showcase your work. So um, that's also something that we like to do and make sure that people know about the amazing work that you're doing. Our platform is useful for not only novel um, research and publishing opportunities, but team science. Um, dissertation theses, poster presentations, class projects, and self-practice, um, just to name a few. All right, so what is this computing environment that we've been talking about? We call it the researcher workbench, and this is how you will start to get your data and analyze your data. So once you have your login, you would log in, and it's gonna take you to this landing page for the researcher workbench. Once you're at the landing page for the researcher workbench, there is a plus sign right by workspaces. And that will in allow you to create your workspace. So all workspaces require a description in the about section about what you are researching. Um, if you are exploring, it's okay, we just wanna know the details of what you're exploring and what you're trying to, um, try to get out of that exploration. Your responses will be made public. Um, again, that researcher uh, projects directory is where your, your project will be listed. And again, that is in the about section. One of the things that's really important to notice is that you will be able to allow people to be writers onto your, um, your project. So you can have someone be an owner, a writer, or, can, um, or a viewer of your, um, your workspace as well. And I'm having a little bit technical difficulty. It's not letting me advance. One second. Okay, here we go. Now I can advance. Okay. So um, we have two point and click tools that you can use. We have our cohort um, tool and we also have our data set builder tool. Our cohort builder tool allows you to pick the inclusion and exclusion criteria of your data set. So you can think of, I wanna study asthma. Okay, so who do I wanna study when it comes to asthma? Um, with our data set tool, once you have your cohort of people that you're interested in, then you can pick the different kinds of concept sets that you're interested in. So I wanna study people, uh, middle-aged people who have asthma, who are on an albuterol inhaler and who have had a pulmonary lung function test. Uh, and that, those are the people that I want to have in my study. 
once you create your your data set, you can then make uh, you can then transfer those uh, records into your Jupyter notebook, and this is where you can start your analysis. And you can think of your Jupyter notebook as like your your lab notebook. All right. So in terms of support resources. We have our um, tutorial workspaces and featured workspaces. And this is where you can see examples of what others have done. Um, these others would be people who, are, who work at the DRC. We have example workspaces. So you can look at coding. Um, you can look at code snippets to get a sense of how you, um, uh, how you might um, create a graph or how you might um, ex um, extract your data. We also have a user support hub um, and it has all the resource materials and documentation that you will ever need. Um, we have it by different data types as well as our policies. And if you find yourself needing more support, we have three options for you. You can always ask us a question at our support desk at support or support at all uh, research all of us at org. We also have our monthly new user orientation, and we also have office hours that occur biweekly, Tuesdays and Fridays. Our Tuesday office hours are ones where you can get a lot of individual um, help, and then our Fridays office hours are office hours where you can uh, learn about some thematic things. Sometimes we have themes such as um, um, policy, uh, a policy themed uh, office hours. Um, you can also ask your questions at office, uh, Friday's office hours as well. All right, so I am going to stop and uh, see, uh, switch it over to data, privacy, and security. Sure, I'm actually, I think I'm gonna just grab the sharing capability from you. It will be easier if I control it. Perfect. All right, and also please note, we've got a couple of questions that haven't been addressed yet. I think um, our team can address them. Let's see, uh, you're gonna have to stop sharing your screen. Okay, uh, there we go. Thank you. Oops, that's not what we want to do. Okay, so um, I want to be able to get to Lena's section of the presentation pretty quickly. So I'm going to highlight some of this so that we get all on the same page. All right, so let me move this out of my screen. Right. Um, so as Danielle was saying, we do have a tiered approach towards access. Um, and so the public tier is you can touch this without having to log in. Um, we've had a lot of people just take a look at what diagnoses, what meds, what types of labs are there that are existing in the system. And I'll show you what this looks like in a second. Um, but it's all summary statistics. Uh, and one of the things that you're going to see also is that these are rounded summary statistics. Everything's rounded to its nearest multiple of 20 so that people can't triangulate against individual participants to try to figure out um, what a specific individual's record looks like in the public domain. Um, and then, and then the, the sandbox environments, which is where the registered and controlled tier live, um, you know, it was already alluded to this is anyone within a trusted organization. And we say this is a trusted organization, it's an organization that's not for profit in the moment in the United States. Um, and, and we, will stand by the fact that the data that you access here has a, has a low risk of re-identification, sufficiently low that um, we believe that the federal government would, would agree with us that this would be compliant with, with HIPAA and related laws. Um, and then the controlled tiers is a little bit different. Um, and so this is uh, for trusted investigators only. And as I'll show you in a moment, you have to go in through login.gov uh, for the most part to get access to it. Um, and so since there's more detail in the data, there's a bit more risk. And so this is why we've limited access. Um, let me skip over this part. 
Uh, all right, so a couple things that are important to recognize is that these environments were built so that they are on the Google Cloud platform. Um, it's all of us is we, we manage it. It is not being moved uh, into your own local environment. So uh, as was uh, said before, like we do start you off with $300 in computing credits. If you're going to use more than that, then you will have to have a, a, a building strategy set up and that's at, left at your discretion or in negotiation with, with your institution. Um, okay, so uh, if you're interested in trying to learn a little bit more about what the data looks like or just what type of data is uh, on hand, you can go over to the data browser. Um, the link was here, but it's not here anymore. So somebody should drop that into the chat. Um, and so as you'll see, there's, there's different domains with respect to the EHR data. This has all been mapped into, into an OMOP standard as, as Lena is gonna go over in a bit, but you'll see that we have data with respect to diagnoses and, or what are defined as conditions, drug exposures, labs and meds, procedures, uh, genomic variants. And as was alluded to, we have about hundred thousand individuals that we've done whole genome sequencing on. Um, what, what's uh, also notable is that there's um, a larger population for which they've had um, genotyping performed. So it's not whole genome sequencing, but we still have uh, some intuition into what their variants within the genome look like. Um, less individuals have um, information about like, um, like, like, like mobility uh, and Fitbit, but, but this, is, this is growing over time. Um, and so this is all EHR data up at the top. This is the genomic data and, and uh, wearables. And then we have all the surveys that we've been doing. Um, if you're interested in taking a look at what this is, uh, here's an example of the type of information that you'll come across. So this is if you had clicked into the conditions, uh, the number one thing that you would have seen in this cohort is that pain is, is number one. Um, followed by massive body structure and then infections. And so all of these have over 100,000 individuals with, with this documentation. Okay, so, so we get asked a lot of questions about what does is, what is protection look like in the system? And so you've seen a little bit of this, but I've, I've broken it down into five parts. Um, the institutional uh, is, is what was shown earlier. Um, there's over 350 institutions that have entered into an agreement with us. And, and the reason why it's just currently done is that um, there, it allows us to have a little bit of bite with respect to the um, accountability so that it's not a, an individual level agreement. Um, this, is, this is an agreement with an organization that can lend some pressure and can exert some um, uh, responsibility onto the individuals who are accessing the data. It does take a little bit of time to get the institutions on board, but once they're on board, um, anybody within that institution is, is able to come into the system to start working with it. Um, <clears throat> so there, when you do that though, there will be an individual level agreement that is established. And this is what we refer to as the data user code of conduct or the DUC. Um, this looks and smells and seems a lot like um, um, a data use agreement for those of you that, that have entered into data use agreements or signed them. Um, but it's, it's a little bit broader than that in that it talks about what uh, not just you're agreeing to, but what the values are of the program and, and how we are expecting you to uh, adhere to them. There's also a specialized ethics training that it has been designed for this program. So it's not quite the same as going through city human subject certification if you've done that, um, or any particular IRB training that you might have gone through. Um, there's just some additional um, classes that will take a little bit of time to go through, but uh, we think it's important for everybody to be aware of, of what, you're, what you're gonna be working with. One of the things that this will cover is um, definitions of stigmatizing research and how that relates to the, the data that will be, that you would be granted access to. Um, so it, it was uh, alluded to that, that all of this was in, in the cloud, but it's not just built directly onto GCP. Uh, it's it, the whole, all of us infrastructure is built on top of um, a system that's called Terra or Terra Bio. 
uh, which was which was initially developed in in um, concert between the Broad Institute and and Verily, which both are um, partners in supporting the uh, the program. Um, this is a it's a FISMA and a FedRAMP certified environment which is why uh, the program is, is comfortable storing the data out in the public domain. Um, specifically, all the data that you're gonna see is it's sitting in a BigQuery environment. Um, this is, this is a, what, what some people refer to as a, as a MapReduce environment. Um, it's, it's not a standard relational database, but it has, uh, it's also what's, what's referred to as a key value store. Um, the, the system itself, so you've got the, the BigQuery as a, as a database, you then will see that you have uh, Jupyter Notebooks with Python markdown or R capability. Um, and then you, you can also grant users access to your workspace. And so it makes it easier for replication so that people don't have to ask you to copy and paste your code into an email and then send it over to them. Um, what we, what we don't allow though at the moment is there's no downloading of the data. Um, so everything does need to be done in the confines of, of GCP. Uh, we do monitor to determine if any particular software package uh, that, that people have uh, integrated into, into the Python or our environment is have, uh, constituting any uh, large amounts of information transfer outside of the system, in which case when we do discover this, we, we do end up uh, shutting that user down for them uh, a time being until we can figure out what specifically is going on. Um, in terms of authentication, I, I mentioned that, that we use login.gov now. This is, this is what's part of uh, a larger initiative that the NIH has been standing up called the Researcher Authentication Service or, or, the, or the RAS. Um, initially, and, and I, I like putting this out there because the history is important here. We, we, we started by requiring everybody to have access to an NIH ERA Commons ID. Um, if you're not familiar with ERA Commons, uh, this, is, this is basically the ID that everybody uses to, to get access to um, the NIH grants management system as well as the manuscript management systems. Um, but we recognize that this was a, a bit limiting in that there are a lot of people uh, affiliated with organizations that, that don't have a direct NIH relationship that are using the system or want to use the system, which is why we migrated out to RAS. Um, the, the data itself, what you're going to find is that it, it has been amended to a certain degree to protect the privacy of the participants. Um, and, and the reason why we do this is because we use this man as a poster child for what can go wrong. Um, this is, this is uh, Bill Weld, who was the governor of the state of Massachusetts and was actually running on a presidential ticket a couple of years ago. Um, the story goes that in the, in the mid nineties, um, uh, he had his, his medical records re-identified in a pretty famous hack. Uh, that was an artifact of how hospital discharge data was collected and shared within the United States. Um, short version of the story was that um, when, when we decided that we as a country decided that we were going to start collecting and sharing uh, data on, on cost effectiveness with respect to care, um, the, the type of data that was collected was, as you see here, some very summarized information about the diagnoses, the procedures, the charges associated with an individual's care, but also the demographics. Um, and, and this was collected at a relatively detailed level. This was, this was pre-HIPAA. Um, and so what was discovered is that he, he was in uh, the hospital discharge data. He had a collapse while he was receiving an honorary doctorate um, and he was on stage. And, and it was a very public event. Nobody knew what happened to him. And it was, it was recognized that there was other types of data, particularly voter registration data, which was in the public domain, relatively cheap to access. I believe he was in the city of Cambridge, which only cost somebody $20 to buy the voter registration list. And when you, when you cross these two resources, he was the only person that had his five digit zip code, his birth date and his gender, who was admitted to Massachusetts General Hospital during that time. So th this is the type of situation where it was not a violation of security. It was a, a violation of the principles of privacy. And this is the basis of, of where a lot of de-identification in HIPAA and other regulation has come from. Um, basically, it's a, we don't want to repeat this scenario. 
Um, that that was a um, you know a lot of people questioned was this a one off? Uh, subsequent studies had shown that if you were to disclose this type of information, particularly five digit zip, birth date, and gender, that somewhere between sixty to eighty seven percent of the USA is is going to be unique on these factors, which is why we don't disclose this information in a in a de identified data set. Um, similarly, you can imagine that it extends beyond demographics. There's been a lot of studies into demographics for re-identification. People have done it also with specific diagnosis codes and rare diseases, health survey responses, lab tests, DNA, the list will go on. And, and then that's the more traditional biomedical environment, but there's also more non-traditional information that, that you can imagine may be integrated into this resource at some point in time. Um, so what we did in, in the All of Us environment was a, a qualitative assessment initially to try to figure out what were all the potential pressure points where re-identification could occur, um, and then what's the chance that somebody would have access to a resource that allowed them to, to run that type of an attack. Um, and so we used that a general assessment to come up with, with a, a, a rubric to figure out what, what we were going to uh, prioritize for for retention as well as suppression within the resource. Um, so, so Danielle alluded to the fact that we, we say that we've gone above and beyond HIPAA. What exactly does that mean? Um, you have to understand that what, what HIPAA does is it allows for two different strategies for de-identification. First, it, it says that under a safe harbor strategy, you could remove 18 specific types of identifiers and say you have no actual knowledge that any of the remaining information could be used to identify someone. That's, that's one way that you could go about doing it. The other way is that you could, you could statistically show that the chance of identification is very small. In that, in that first one, that, that safe harbor approach, there, there is no measurement that takes place. Um, we, we try to use the second one to, to come back and, and say that not only do we, we think that this is okay, but, but we've shown that the probability of an identification is, is very small. Um, so, this, however, does not guarantee that data cannot be re-identified. It just means that it's an extremely small chance that will happen, which is why we don't put this out in the public domain. Um, so to give you a little bit of intuition into what, what the differences are, like what we've done to the data and what the differences are between what you're going to see in registered and if you go into controlled tiers, uh, this, will, this will give you an idea of what's going on. A um, little bit of a summary here. Um, you've heard that dates are shifted in the registered tier. We've also generalized the geolocation of where somebody is to the level of US state and registered tier. Um, it'll be at the level of the first three digits of the zip code in the controlled tier. Um, we also made some amendments for race and ethnicity and sex and sexuality, uh, education level and employment status. Now, what I'll show you what those are in a second, um, but but this was done because of the fact that we had some very small groups with, within the, uh, the data set initially, and that over time, it's expected that we will be able to share more detail. Um, at the present moment, we have around uh, four to 500,000 participants. We're working towards a million. And so over the next several years, these rules will probably become more lax. Um, certain things that we didn't include in the registered tier because we were just, we were too worried about the potential for identification was um, whether or not somebody was in active duty military, which was information that we had initially collected, uh, what specifically caused their death, um, if, if that was documented, it's not always documented, what their current living situation was. Um, but you'll also see there are some things that we still haven't put into controlled tier. So for instance, anything that has to do with motor vehicle accidents. Uh, particularly when we revealed the actual date, uh, we were concerned that that would be um, uh, a hot spot for re-identification because of the fact that it has been used in, in multiple hacks in the past. Uh, and, and while we have been collecting all the free text in the medical records, we're not putting all of that into the, um, into the resource at the moment. So let me skip this part. Um, so what specifically have we done? Um, you heard that we were date shifting several times, um, but I think more importantly, with respect to what the AIMAHEAD program is striving to, uh, to do, which is the reduction of health disparities in the context of machine learning, um, you know, this is their, our first approximation was that 
we had enough people who were designated as white, black, or Asian to retain them as they were, as, as well as Hispanic. Um, where things, we did not have enough participants initially in the space of, of the Native American population or people of Middle Eastern heritage uh, or the NHPI population, even though this, this is a focus of, of Aim Ahead uh, at the time, at the current time, uh, we still do not have a sufficient number of participants in all of us to, to make it easy to share that information in the registered tier. Um, a couple other things that we did. Uh, so sex at birth, uh, we left it at male or female and then um, individuals who were designated as intersex, uh, they were, we only had a couple of those participants. And so therefore that category three and four were grouped together. Similar situation with respect to gender and identity, man, woman, and then it's other or unknown. Um, with respect to uh, uh, whether or not an individual was cis or trans, uh, at the present moment in time, even though the program, um, so, so this information is in the, in the controlled tier, it's not in the registered tier. Uh, it is either straight or other at the present moment in time. Um, a couple of examples of, of how that propagates throughout the system. Uh, so sex is designated uh, as, as, as a explicit field within the medical record as well as in the survey responses, but you can see how this, this propagates through the diagnosis codes as well that can show up in an individual's medical record. And so we've scrubbed this information out as well. Um, we did some general groupings with respect to the education uh, levels of everybody. There still was some clear distinction of different levels of education, but we, we removed specific indicators. For instance, um, if an individual was a holder of, a, of a, an advanced degree, they, they were grouped into, into uh, one particular group. Uh, same thing with respect to employment. Uh, we, at the present moment in time, we are, we're not gonna be disclosing an individual's ex specific type of employment uh, or, or whether or not they had been out of work for a particular period of time. Uh, and so that information was, was grouped together into an employed and, and, and not employed. Uh, we also removed things that we knew made it a lot easier to identify people. So in the registered tier, you're not going to be find indicators of, of live-born uh, events, uh, birth particularly, but the ones that we were, we were also really concerned about were uh, indicators of, of public events uh, as well, such as operations of war uh, or terrorism, which, which you might look at this and say, oh, how, how could that show up in an individual's medical record? I, I can tell you that we, we have seen situations where individuals were involved uh, with things like the, the, um, the Boston Marathon bombing, where terrorism shows up within the diagnosis codes in their medical record. And that becomes a pretty um, uh, obvious event for trying to track somebody down. Um, so, so as I mentioned, there's, there's, this resource is still not devoid of risk. And so we get asked all the time, so what do we do if somebody violates the terms? Um, this at the present moment is, is handled on a case by case basis. Uh, and, and this is mainly because we just don't have enough evidence. Uh, there, there has not really been a situation where somebody has gone out to explicitly violate the data user code of conduct. Um, and so things that we could do is that we could shut down access to the resource, we could work with the NIH to ensure that an individual loses federal funding if they have any, or that their institution loses federal funding. There could be a prohibition on future funding. Um, there could be criminal penalties that are sought if there's a malicious act, uh, because this is not just an agreement with, with us, this is an agreement with the federal government. Um, but as I said, this is something that it has not transpired. We hope that it does not transpire, but that's why it's a case by case basis. I believe that we are now gonna pause for station identification. I'm looking at Danielle. Yep. We are gonna have a break. Um, let's see if there's any questions and answers. So that doesn't look like there are any unanswered questions that I can see. But if you do have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask a question at this time.
And if not, uh, feel free to take the next, let's say five minutes to take a short break. Talk amongst yourselves. I see there's a question by Mary. It would be helpful to get more details on the cost if possible. Don't know if you want to get it right now or later. Yes, um, let's answer that question now. Um, Haral or Gage, would you mind answering that question? I'm trying to find it in the chat or in that question and answer. Yeah, sure. I can I can chime in first and Gage, feel free to add any details that you think would be more helpful. So basically, whenever a researcher is registered on the researcher workbench, they would all get around 300, like they would get $300 as credits. And based on the prior work, uh, like that our researchers have done, it says that this is like kind of a sufficient amount. And we also have like a article which lists all the costs associated with the tutorial workspaces. And if you see the range of the cost, it goes from as little as $10 to $50. So if your project entails phenotypic data, which includes EHR, surveys, wearables, physical measurements, then definitely it is, uh, $300 seems very reasonable. And again, if you wanna do genomics data analysis, we have amazing resources on how you can restrict your sample size and uh, make sure that it is feasible and you don't like, like because we understand that running genomics analysis is very, very expensive. So we have some tricks and tips in place for you on the researcher workbench to help you get started. It's similar, you should, we should also just clarify, it's, it's, it's similar in cost to using the cloud. Um, so it's, uh, I can give an example of, Training, training one large recurrent neural net uh, in this environment uh, cost us about ten dollars. So it's you should have sufficient funding to do what you need to do for working in that space initially. Yeah, and it costs only I think. 20 cents per hour. So if you run like the notebook for an hour, it will cost you like 20 cents. If it's paused and you're looking, it's going to cost per hour one cent. So let's say if you want to run the notebook or for a model for 10 hours, it's going to cost maybe like up to two dollars when you run that notebook for like 10 hours straight. Yeah, and if you use a point and click tools like cohort builder and data set builder tools, there's no cost associated to it. You can basically query it using a graphical interface for free. We had another question um, that was asked in the chat um, that if you are a PhD candidate, can you, um, can you register with us? And yes, you can, as long as your institution has a data and registration agreement with us. Um, and I've provided the link in the chat where you can check, you would be able to register with us. Okay. Um, if your institution does not have an agreement yet, there is a link for you to start that process. And I can find that and I will also put that um, in the chat as well as in the Q&A section. In my case, if there was an accident, she does not have any questions, so. You need to be careful. You have a little bit of a scratch in your, uh, in your audio. 
I don't know. Oh. I, I don't know if you're using the right microphone or if you're not close enough to your microphone. Hold on. I was trying to use the AirPod. That that might be it. All right. So we'll take a, just a, a few more questions and then we'll um, commence with the presentation. So I see one that says, so alumni can't do that. People who have graduated and not have a job yet. Okay. So in the future, we do, I, I see Brad. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the that first time I've ever heard that question. That's yeah, in, in the future, we do we do have plans to make uh, this resource available to uh, an expanded audience, including um, citizen scientists. Um, but we are not at that point yet. Um, but we definitely would still love for you to check in with us and see the work that we are doing. Um, I can't give you a timeline of when that will be available. What that is in the works. It, it is in the works. I, I, I think the short answer to the question is there are no alumni sponsorships. <laughs> okay, Lena, are you ready? Yes, I can share my screen now because I'm going to also share the workspace afterwards. So let's start. I'm going to share it on my entire desktop. So everybody can see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. So today we're going to talk about or provide a showcase on how you can build a machine learning model in the, using the all of us data set. But before we get into that, there is a basic knowledge that you might need in order to be able to get your hands dirty in the all of us data, extract the data and build your model. And we're going to start with a quick introduction for the EHR data. So in a simple definition, EHR is an electronic version of the patient's record where authorized users or healthcare providers can have an instant access to the patient's record, which includes the treatment information about the patient that the patients usually go under when they go to the visit to visit the healthcare organization, or even sometimes outside the healthcare organization. And there are different EHR data types. Sometimes you hear data types or data. Uh, EHR data domains or categories, they all mean the same. There's demographic information that where the where it lists information about the patient, such as race, gender, uh, the date of birth, sometimes annual income. There is also lab tests. Uh, there's med the medications that the, has been prescribed to the patients. And there are also diagnosis codes, which are the codes for the diseases and the conditions that the patient has been diagnosed with. There are also procedures that are used in order as a part of the diagnostic process to know what's wrong with the patients. There are also visits, encounters, visits or encounters. They mean also the same. And there's also medical devices that are usually uh, planned here or like they're used in order to put or like to make sure that the patient's condition is under control. All of those data types follow under uh, like what we call also structured data where you can store it in a table format and each data type can have a specific elements that describe this data. For instance, in the, in the uh, lab tests, you will see that there's a code for the lab test, there's a code, there's a lab name, as well as the values or the test results. There is also another kind of EHR data called unstructured data. One of them is the images such as CT scan or X-ray. We don't have that currently in the all of us. And there is also the clinical notes which are a free text format where, their health, where, they, where the healthcare providers type in a free text format, their interactions with the patients, the way that like what they ordered in order to make the uh, diagnosis. And that's not included in the all of us data set. All the above in the structured format, they are included in the all of us data set. So for instance, if we're going to talk about the patients, 
usually like each patient visit is a combination of those different EHR types. You will rarely find that the patient's visit will have only one of those EHR data. So it's kind of a mix between medications, diagnosis codes, and the procedures as the example that we have on this slide shows. So John has type two diabetes. They went to their healthcare provider in order to renew their metformin prescriptions. And you can see like type two diabetes, it has the diagnosis uh, or the condition type. Metformin, which is an anti-diabetic that's used in order to keep the diabetes uh, under control, it's all, it will be also, or it has the type of medications. Now, in order to make sure when we have this information in the EHR, we need a standard way in order to save this information. So if two healthcare providers in the same organization or even in different healthcare organization, when they talk, for instance, about metformin, they have to make sure that they are speaking the same language in order to avoid having any medical errors. And that's why we use something called clinical terminology or medical terminology, which are systems that have or include standardized terms and their synonyms. And for each one of those terms, there's a specific assigned code that will distinguish or highlight that this unique identifier or this unique code belongs to this term. So if two healthcare providers are talking, let's say about the metformin that has been prescribed to John, you would know exactly which metformin, which brand, and which tablet. You will know all the information about this. And those terminologies cover uh, like different EHR types. There are terminologies for findings. There are terminologies for visits. So it includes all the clinical events that happens to the patients inside the healthcare organization. And they are really useful because you can use the, you can uh, store the information really quickly in the EHR. You can extract the information really quickly, whether to view it for the healthcare provider or even for the research purposes. It makes it much easier to extract this information from the EHR. And it also one of the other benefits for the clinical terminologies, it's, it's, will standardize the way that different healthcare providers within the same organization or different organization will talk about those uh, codes or those EHR data elements or events or types. Now, there are five, I think, main clinical terminologies that are mainly used, and you will see very often, especially in the all of us. The first one is the ICD, uh, and there are different versions of the ICD. This, like the ICD codes are mainly used for billing purposes. And there are different versions. There is ICD-9, there is ICD-10, and there's ICD-10-CM that's mainly used in the US. So for instance, if we're going to talk about type two diabetes, the ICD code for type two diabetes without complication is 250.00. While in ICD-10, the same code had like the, same, the code for the type two diabetes without complication has been changed to the E11, Point nine. So when health two healthcare provider put like in the patient chart that the patient has been diagnosed with E11.9, it means that the patient has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes without complication. The second terminology is the CPT, which are coding scheme for surgical and diagnostic procedures. The third one is called SNOMED, which is a multidisciplinary terminology that's considered the standard way to describe or to code diagnoses symptoms, clinical findings, and sometimes even some medications. We have also Rx norm, uh, which is a coding system that's uh, for drugs or standard terminologies for drugs. And finally, there's the LOIN code that is a standard terminologies that provide standard codes for lab tests and a clinical observation. Now we have the EHR data, we have the clinical terminologies. All we need right now is a place to store this data. So the EHR system has their own schema, but we're going to focus on the schema or the way that we're going to store, to store this data for research purposes. Now, I think it was like before 15 years ago, each organization has their own like data model or their own schema where they store the data. But recently the medical informatics community started to shift toward even standardizing the data model that you will use in order to store those data for research, which is like, and this is where they started talking about using the common data models to store data for research. 
There are different ones, but the one that's most commonly used right now is something called OMAP, CMD, or OMAP Common Data Model, that is maintained by the Odyssey community. So what the Odyssey community did, she, like they created like a relational database in order to store clinical research repository so researchers can use the same data set. Not only that, it will help to standardize even the way that you write the code or the queries. So at VUMC, if I'm working with someone else from Columbia, we have the standard terminology. We also have the standard data model like that we both store our research data in. All we need is just to take one of the queries and just send it to the other person, which will help making replicating research studies much easier. Now, another thing that the Odyssey team did is creating something called OMAP vocabulary. They did not create their own vocabulary. What they did, they got all the medical terminologies that the healthcare organization use, including ICD-9, ICD ICD-10, SNOMED, Boeing, RxNOR and SNOMED, and they all combined it in one big vocabulary. They called it the OMAP vocabulary. Each one of those concepts or codes have its own unique OMAP concept identifier in order to make sure that you will have one code. So regardless of the terminologies that the concept came from, it will have an OMAP concept that you will use or throw out the coding system in order to be able to retrieve the concepts and the codes that you will be using. So for instance, going back to the SNOM, to the SNOMED code for type two diabetes, this code will exist, but it has been already assigned OMAP concept identifier that you can use in order to extract all the patients who have this SNOMED code, and you can use the OMAP concept identifier. Now, because this uh, data model has been used widely, especially within the Odyssey community, that's like that, it, like that has a research organization from different parts of the US and Europe, the All of Us Research Program adapted the OMAP in order to store the EHR data and the survey data. Now, what does the OMAP include? And as well as the All of Us data include, are the following table. You have the person table that include the patient's demographics. You have condition occurrence table that include diseases and diagnosis codes. You have a drug exposure that include medications and drugs. Procedure occurrence, which include like the procedure codes, visits, occurrence about like information about visits, measurements for lab and tests, observation, some of the measurements and some of the clinical observation, as well as the all of us survey data. There is also device exposure that includes some of the devices that the participants have. There is also tables in or that list or that that's mainly for the concepts or the OMAP concepts. The first one is the concept table that include the list of the concept identifiers or all the concepts that OMAP uses. There is the table concept relationship that uh, lists the relationship between two different concepts and the concept and sister that lists the hierarchical relationship between different codes. Each one of those table has different columns, but they also share, they each one of those should have those three main columns, regardless of what this data or this column is. They should have the person ID because you need to know if like, uh, for instance, in the condition table to which participant this diagnosis, go, the diagnosis could belong to. You have the OMAP concept identifier in order to know which concept uh, is included in this row, and the original or the source concept identifier, for instance, it will include the SNOMED source code for type 2 diabetes. And this is a snapshot for the condition occurrence table that you can add, like that you can see, oh, there's the uh, person ID, which is a person identifier or a unique identifier for the person or the participant in the all of us. You have the condition concept ID, which is the OMAP concept for the condition. And you can see on the far right, there is also the source concept code in order to maintain or make sure that we, that we provide the source codes that the healthcare organization or like how did this uh, row or like how did this information was coded in the EHR or in the original EHR before it was converted to OMAP. So for instance, if we're going to take this example, uh, type 2 diabetes will be stored in the uh, condition occurrence table. 
uh, the uh, metformin will be uh, such as the metformin information, such as the date of the uh, prescription, the dose of the prescription will be also stored in the drug exposure table. So all of them will have date information for people who are asking what information do we have, mainly date information, concept identifiers, uh, for, for medication, we have dose information. For, for the lab measurements, we have the results as well. And those are a couple of useful links that you can use in order to know more. So the first one is a link to the Wiki website for Odyssey. So if you want to use the All of Us data, I really highly recommend going through that and understand what each table includes because that will help you and make it easier for you to extract the data. The second one is Athena, which is a user-friendly website that I even still use in order to say what are the concept identifier, for instance, for the weight measurement. So I can go there, type weight, and a list of concepts will appear to me and I can use them in order to uh, know exactly which concept I should use in my data. And speaking of data extraction, I'm going to provide a quick overview how you can extract data from the all of us. So the first one is using the graphical user interface. And the second one is using SQL query. And Danielle touched upon how you can use the, graphic, the graphical user interface or the all of us tool in order to extract the data. You can use the cohort builder in order to extract a cohort. No, now, in a nutshell, what a cohort is, it's the group of patients of, or participants that you're going to perform your analysis on. So it's just like the specific set of participants. It was like, oh, this is the patients that I'm going to conduct my analysis on. And you need, again, inclusion and exclusion criteria in order to extract that cohort. And Danielle like, put it really in a, like, in a nice way. Inclusion criteria is the rules that you need in order to say those patients will be included in my cohort. And the exclusion criteria are the rules that patients should not have in order to be included in my criteria. If they have that exclusion criteria, they will be excluded from the cohort. So if you want to build a cohort in order to analyze the complications that patients with type 2 diabetes will have, your inclusion will include have that the patients should have type 2 diabetes, they should, have, they should have the age at the first diagnosis should be 18 years or older, older, and their A1C level should be higher than seven. And the exclusion that we should not include participants who have type two diabetes during pregnancy because that was kind of an induced uh, type two diabetes that will go away after the pregnancy end. There is also another thing that I would like to say about this cohort that you can even include some temporal inclusion criteria. So you can say, I want the A1C level to be higher than seven before the first time that type two diabetes diagnosis code appeared in the person in the patient record. There's also the data set builder, which will help you extract the EHR or the survey data element that you're going to apply your analysis on for the cohort that you already defined. Now, the second way to extract the data is using SQL query. Now, there are different experience levels in this group, but even if you haven't used SQL query, SQL query is a command-based language. Whether you're running simple query or a complex query, there are very few handful of commands that you need to use in order to extract any kind of data. The first one is select which will help you to define the list of columns or the set of columns that will be returned by your query. So in the table, if you're interested in a specific set of columns, you can list the name of the columns that you want to extract the data from. And if you want all the columns, you can just put an asterisk. The second command is from, which you use in order to define or to say the table name or to list the table name that you're going to extract the data from. So for instance, if you want to extract data from the person table, you select select asterisk from person. The third command is called join. And like this is a really powerful command because in this case, you can join the columns from two different table using if, like if those two tables have a specific key value or key column that will help you to say like if the rows in table one and table two have the same value, it means that they belong to the same uh, like entity or person. And in this case, you can actually combine it in order to create like this, uh, com like in order to create this big data set. 
So if we have, if we want to link the person table to the condition occurrence table in order to combine demographics with the conditions information, you can use the join in order to combine both those two tables. And there are different versions. The most commonly one used is just like the, and like the join where you just like say, I'm going to include only rows that exist in both, where like the key value exist in both tables. For instance, if I'm going to join person and condition occurrence, I'm going to join them in the person ID to make sure that I'm including rows for the participants who have rows in the person and the condition occurrence table. And for time's sake, I'm going to like let you go through this, the other list or the other options of join on your own. The third, the fourth option or the third like useful command is where, where you define the inclusion and exclusion like rules or criteria for which rows will be included in the data set that will be returned by the query. You can use a numerical expression such as greater or less. So you can say, I want the uh, A1C value greater than seven in order to return only measurements that has the A1C value higher than seven. There's also string uh, comparison operators such as like and uh, not like, and there's the between in order to apply the exclusion, the inclusion criteria for like ranges of values. And finally, if you're running this in the all of us, after you write your own query, all you have to do is write this code or like write this Python line in order to run the query and extract the data from the all of us. And again, as Brad mentioned, uh, the all of us data set is hosted in BigQuery. So now I'm going like I when I looked at the uh, data or like what the workshop covered, a lot of people talked about like machine learning. So, I'm, but I'm going to provide a really quick introduction about the things that I'm going to specifically show or like uh, go through during uh, the showcase. So, machine learning models in uh, like briefly, it's a process of using mathematical models in order to take whatever input data set you have and the outcome or the output of interest and try to identify what like the patterns or the relationship between the input data and the outcome of interest uh, that you're interested in uh, in order like and it identify the patterns in order to understand what is the relationship between the input data and the outcome of interest that you're looking for without having direct instructions. So there are like, without providing those specific rules that uh, follows the if, else, and then. Now, usually the raw data and whether in the clinical data or in general, they're not usually digestible by the machine learning model or the mathematical model. So you need to do something called data processing or pre-processing or feature engineering, which is the process of manipulating and transforming the raw data into something we called features or variables. Now the features or the variables are independent variables that have values and formats that the computer model can understand. For instance, if race as a string will not be digested by the computer, so you have to create features from those from the race values in order to make sure that the computer model can understand what kind like the like this race is why the race of this participants is black. And we usually spend more like 70% of our time, I would say at least trying to select the features or identify the features that we're going to include in our model. And especially for clinical data, we mostly collaborate with uh, collaborators or colleagues who have the clinical domain expert, so we don't include features that kind of will tip the model. Um, will tip the model. Now there are different kind of features or different types of features. You have continuous features such as numerical values, example patient's age. You have the categor uh, categorical values or variables or features, which are features that include or has only a specific set of values, but there is no order or real, no relation, numerical relationship between the values. For instance, the race, there is no specific order for the race. You can, like, you can present or write the race in any order. There is the ordinal values, which are features that has also a specific set of values, but the order for those features are important or like they have an incremental relationship. For instance, about the education categories, like you will start from when you rank it, you rank it for 
let's say participants who have no high school degree, then participants who have GAD, then participants who have college uh, experience from one to three years old, and then college graduate and so on. And finally, you will have the binary feature which has a Boolean value. Okay, we're doing good on time. Now, the same thing applies for the output or the labels. You still need sometimes to transfer the, the output or the labels in order to be able to send or to uh, be used by the machine learning model, which when we talk about like model, like output, sometimes we refer to it as output, labels, classes, they're all kind of the same. It depends on uh, which terminology uh, it's mainly used in your field. And, uh, and it's the variable of interest that the model is trying to predict. There are like, they have almost the same kind or types as the input features. So they can be binary or two classes. Uh, there can be continuous, uh, continuous output or uh, con uh, continuous labels. They can be also category, uh, category variables or multiple classes. And at the end, when you pass this, uh, when you try to apply your model, you will end up with having a data set that includes features where each column represents a feature and each row represents uh, a sample, or in this case, a participant data. And you will have your own label or the label of interest that you're trying to predict. Now, there are like a lot of machine learning models out there and I'm listing only a few and you will find even more when you like, when you look for a list, uh, there are like models for binary classes or labels, such as logistic regression and random forest. There are also models for multiple classes, uh, such as multinomial logistic regression or even convolutional neural network, where the output is, is more than one class, uh, such as the, like, the diagnosis code that the patient will have in the next visit. And there's also models for continuous diseases. But I'm going to provide a very brief description about three models because those are like two of those we will be using in the showcase model or in the showcase that we're going to talk about next. So first of all is logistic regression, which is a model that you use in order to predict a binary outcome or a binary class that has two classes or like zero and one. And logistic regression is a linear, is a linear function. Which, uh, which provide uh, or try to learn a linear combi a combination of variable, like a linear combination of variables where you pass the variable to the model and the model will try to learn the linear coefficients or the coefficients that describe the relationship between the input that you have or you pass and the output. For instance, if we look at each one of those coefficients, usually they're called beta, you look at this beta one, beta one, once the model learn it, or like when the model learn it, it will learn the relationship between the input or the feature X one and the output, whether like, for instance, whether the patient will have a chronic disease or not. And the output of the model will be just the probability of the event happening or the probability of this uh, class is happening, especially like whether the, the conditional probability that this event will happen. And usually the probability value will range from zero to one, where one, uh, like it, it means that this event is most likely to happen while the values that's close to zero will mean that the event is unlikely to happen. Now there are a lot of advent, like there are like a couple of advantages for you just uh, for using logistic regression. The first one, it's easy to understand. It can be interpreted. So when you look at the coefficients, you will know exactly what is the relationship between variable x one and the output. And usually, there's not a lot of assumption made about the class distribution. The disadvantages for the logistic regression, it's a linear model. So if you want to have nonlinear relationship, you have to code that in the feature engineering, or you have to basically tell the model that this relationship should be nonlinear. Uh, the second one, which I'm not mentioning here, that you have to be careful when if two variables are correlated with each other, because the correlation will influence uh, the performance of the model. And finally, the model will not be generalizable, or it will overfit when the number of the features is much, much higher than the training sample. Now, if it, uh, what, what I mean by overfitting is that the model has been trained and tailored to a specific data set that it fits this data set perfectly when you try to use it on another data set. 
it will not be it will not like perform as well it will have actually like a really bad performance it's similar if you have like a tailored like shirt for a specific person where it like it's per fits perfectly for all like the curse for like one person when another person is trying to take to like wear the same shirt it's not going to fit it's going to have like a horrible fit the second model is decision tree which is a non-parametric or non-linear model and it usually follows the f then else method and in that you will see like there are like the decision tree will have nodes it will have each node represent a variable. It will have the branches, which include the decision boundaries that will lead the feature from one node to the other, all the way until it reaches to the leaves, which are the classes that you are trying to predict. Now, when you train the decision tree model, what the decision tree will learn are the decision boundaries. So when you train a model on like the type two diabetes cohort, what it will learn is that, oh, if I actually, pick the threshold for the number of the diagnosis code for type 2 diabetes as 2 and A1C to be higher than the 7, then the patient is most likely to be diabetic or have type 2 diabetes. Now, the advantages for using the uh, decision tree, again, they can handle high dimensional data. They can account for the nonlinearity of the data. Uh, they can also, you can use categorical and uh, continuous data. It can be easily interpretable, especially if you visual, because you can visualize and see the decision in tree. But the disadvantage for this model that it has a small tendency to overfit the data, so close to the data, which means that you might have a hard time sometimes generalizing this model. And finally, we there is like random forest, which is one of the most common models out there. And a lot of people are using this, which is a, an ensemble of decision in trees where each one of those trees is a trained on a subset of the samples and subset of the features. And each tree will provide, when it's trained on that subset of the data set, will it provide a prediction to a class. Now, the final prediction will be the majority word or the collective prediction for all the decision trees or the tiny decision trees in this random forest or like in the forest of decision trees. It's similar to the crowdsourcing concept when you ask multiple people about a question and the majority or, or like you will say like the correct answer would, will be whatever the majority says. Uh, there is a lot like there are like a couple of advantages for using the uh, random forest. It can handle nonlinear data pretty well. It can have a better grip on the overfitting of the data better than the decision trees. But one of the few disadvantages for the random forest, if you have a sparse data where you have a lot of zeros and one, like a lot few ones and like a lot of zeros, it may not perform very well. It depends again how you train the model. Now, there are like different steps when you try to train the model. You, there's like training the model where uh, the model at this phase will uh, learn the patterns and the relationship between the input features and the output. There is the validation step where you validate the performance of the model using performance metrics that we're going to talk briefly about in the next couple of slides. And you can also use the validation step in order to identify which parameters of this specific model will give me the best performance. In this, for instance, in random forest, is using 100 trees better than using 50 trees, or is it going to be better than using 200 trees in my random forest? And you have the test data set, which is an unseen data set that you don't involve in any of the training or any of the validation and you leave it as the last step in order to make sure that when you provide the performance on the model on the test set, it will mimic, it will provide a realistic uh, performance so for the what the model is going to behave when it's out there in the real world. Now, when you also build the model, there are like two different ways to build a machine learning model. You can use something called k-fold cross-validation and you use this model or this method when you have a small sample size. For instance, if your sample size is 300 or 500, you can use k-fold cross-validation. And the way that you do it is you divide your data set into k different subsections or folds, and you go through the data 
k fold. So like, let's assume that the k equal to 10. So if you're doing 10 fold across validation, you divide the data set into 10 folds and you go through the data set for the first time. You take fold number 10 as you as a data set, you hold it out, you train the model on the folds from one to nine, and you evaluate or validate the performance of the model on the holdout data set, which was fold 10. Then you move on to the next iteration where you take another fold that has not been included or that has not been used as a holdout data set, which is fold, let's say fold eight. And then you train the model on the rest of the folds. And once you train the model, you provide or you evaluate the performance of the model on the holdout data set, which is fold number eight. And you keep doing this until you use all the folds as a validation set. The second one is train validation test method. Uh, and this is like really useful when you have a big data set. The common split usually, people have different ways of splitting the data. One of the common way of splitting the data set is you save 80% for training, 10% for validation, and 10% for testing. To train the model, you use 80% of the data in order to train the model, and you sum, like, and then you summarize the performance on the validation. But also, you will use the validation set in order to do something called tuning the model, where you try different versions of the model by passing different parameters. So going back to the random forest uh, example, you can, trick, you can train like our forest, like random forest model one by using 100 trees. You train the model, you provide uh, the performance of the model on the validation set. Then you train another version of random forest model where you use 200 trees, you train it, you validate the model and you save the performance metric and you compare which one has better performance. And then you keep changing the parameters where you do like something called grid search where you change the different parameters until you're satisfied and say like, okay, I have my optimal model for random forest that has the highest performance on the validation set. And I will do the same thing for logistic regression. And the reason why it's really important because when you do this and you compare between different models, the comparable will be actually more reliable and more fair, especially for a model, a linear model, when you compare a linear model like logistic regression to a nonlinear model like random forest. And finally, once you train the model and you're satisfied with the optimal model, you combine the training and validation set, you train the optimal model on the training and validation, and you report the data, the performance of the model on the unseen data set, AKA the test data set. Now, in order to evaluate the machine learning model, you can use different metrics. You can use the AUC or as we call area under the curve, which it provides a measurement for the ability of the model to distinguish between two different classes. The second performance metric is accuracy, which uh, provides the proportion of the samples that the model was able to identify correctly. The third metric, which is used a lot in the clinical informatics or like in the medical field, which is called sensitivity, which is the ability of the model to identify the positive label or whether the patient has a disease. And it's used a lot if you build a model to identify whether a patient will have a specific disease or a specific phenotype or a specific condition in the future. And finally, there is the specificity, which is the ability of the model to identify the negative labels or whether the patient does not have a disease or not. All those metrics range from zero to one, and you want your model to have like a value that's closer to one because the higher the value is, the better the model is. Now, let's talk about the showcase and for like, uh, building like a, uh, a showcase to how you how to use like the, the all of us data set to build a machine learning model. We thought like they were going to provide a more general one rather than a phenotype specific one. And we thought that we can provide or build a model that will help us to identify which patient, after the patient is enrolled in the all of us, which one of those patients will have a new chronic diseases uh, within one year after the enrollment. And the reason why this might be an interesting problem because when the patients are diagnosed with a new chronic disease, they will have a higher, they will utilize the healthcare system more, meaning they will have 
more appointment they might have more appointments they will definitely require more medications in order to keep that uh, disease under control they will have like more labs in order to make sure that the uh, disease is not progressing and they will have like different visits to, uh, to different healthcare providers so the desired outcome in this or the output that we are trying to predict is whether the patient will be diagnosed with uh, with a new chronic disease within one year after the enrollment. And the possible features that we thought of using is like using some of the main labs that usually healthcare providers order on a regular basis in order to see whether the patients will have chronic disease or not, uh, demographics information, previous chronic conditions, and the healthcare utilization variables. And we thought like an our cohort will include participants who have all those four or five main lab test values. So all the participants in our cohort should have systolic blood pressure before the enrollment or within one year before the enrollment, A1C lab tests, hematocrat, which measures how much red blood cells that the patients have in their, like in their blood, uh, which will determine whether the patient is a good health or like might be anemic. There is also creatinine that measures the uh, renal function or the kidney function and the low density lipoprotein or LDL which is the bad cholesterol that we want the patients to keep on the low side. And this will help us understand whether the patient, it's a really good, it's a good biomarker for uh, heart disease as well. Now, what, what Danielle mentioned also that the All of Us Research uh, Program collects data via survey. And some of, the, some of the data that they collect is annual income and education. And both of those can be really hard to extract from the all of us. Not only that, but they are also essential in some of the health disparity work that sometimes if you want to conduct, we usually have access to research, but also health disparities will also like annual income, education of the patients, the insurance status of the patient can also play a major role whether they will have access to healthcare or not. So to do that, or to build the model, this is what we did. We defined, or like we identified when the patient was enrolled or the participant was enrolled. We extract the age at enrollment. We also uh, uh, like extracted race, gender identity. We extracted the education of the participants from the survey, income variable, and insurance. And again, those can be really hard, except the insurance, those can be really hard to extract from the EHR data. And as a feature for the model, we went back one year before the enrollment and identified whether the patient or the participant was diagnosed in a 29 chronic uh, disease diagnoses, uh, like a list of 29 uh, chronic diseases. Uh, the healthcare utilization of the patient summarized by number of medications, number of conditions, procedures, and visits. And finally, the main lab test statistics, including the count of those main lab tests, the mean, the minimum, and the maximum. And then we extracted also the outcome data. Now I'm going to go over the workspace in order to make sure that you can get an idea how this does look like in the all of us workspace. Can you see a workspace or not? Danielle, can you see the workspace? Yes. Okay, perfect, yes. All right. So again, um, those are like kind of like the uh, idea, like this is like the libraries that, will be, uh, you, that you will use in order to extract the data from the all of us. And this is the details about the, the, the analysis. So you have the demographics, you have the indicator whether the participants have active conditions uh, within one year before the enrollment, biomarkers, and health, the number of unique medications and procedures. So the notebook uh, like will be available for you to be able to use it, reuse it, take some of the codes tomorrow. And we divided this notes, like notebook into different sections. The first one will tell you how to extract the features from the All of Us data. So you can use this code in order to extract demographics, uh, specifically like year of birth, gender identity, race of the participants and the ethnicity. And you can also view it like this in order to know uh, which, uh, like uh, how does this data frame look like? You can also, like the code also include ways in order to extract the income and the education from uh, like that has been collected by, via the survey. Uh, 
Again, as a reminder, those information, it, like the survey information or the survey answers exist in the observation table. So this is the code that you'll be able to use in order to extract both of those uh, features. There is also code in order to extract insurance information about the participants. And this is like, it will show like what kind of insurance do the participants have. And then you can also extract the year of the enrollment by extracting the year that the participants consented to share their EHR or to participate in the all of us. And again, as part of the feature engineering, we're going to use the road, like the year of enrollment and the year of birth in order to calculate the age of enrollment. We're good on time. Uh, and then this function or like this cell will merge the, because like, if you're going to write this as a big query, it can be it can get really big, really hairy, and it will take much longer time to execute. This is why divided or chunked the execution of the or like the demographic extraction into chunks because it's going to be much faster. And using the Python code in order to merge or combine those different data sets will not take as uh, much time. This is one of the ways that you can just like, just to help you to be kind of efficient uh, when you try to use the all of us data and save some of the money uh, that you have or the credit. Now this cell or this function uh, will, you can use it in order to extract the measurements or a specific list of measurements that are defined by a specific concept identifier. And you can use this function in order to extract those measurements that has been inserted or are part of the participants record within one year before the enrollment. So it will go back all one year before the enrollment in the participants record and will extract the measurements that you specify using the concept identifier list. So for instance, this is a list of concept identifier for systolic blood pressure. You, when you pass it to this function, the function will return a data frame that include the systolic blood measurements that the participants uh, like that were like that were taken for the participants within one year before the enrollment. And the same thing, we have like a list of LG, LG concepts, A1C concepts, and so on. And this those cells will extract this information from the participants record. Now, because we defined our inclusion cohort that we need participants who have measurements for all those five different lab tests, this cell will extract or identify which participants have values for those five different measurements. And then, and this is going to be our cohort of participants who are going to conduct the analysis on. So the final number of participants who have the four different or the five different lab values is around 35,000 participants. And then we, in this one, we just like only restricted the demographics to those participants so we can be more computationally efficient. Once you have that, one of the things that you usually do when you build like a model or we try to end like to build a model, it's really, an important way to get a grip on how does you, your cohort will look like. So you can visualize the gender uh, identity in the participants, uh, for the participants in your uh, analysis or your cohort. For instance, in this cohort, they're like mainly the participants are identified as women. More than 50% are identified as women. Uh, we did the same thing for the race. Uh, around like 55% of the participants are white and around 20% of the participants are uh, black. And you can see, you can also plot some distribution for the age at enrollment. You can also plot that it's like the not like percentage of the participants based on their like education level and the annual income. Now, the reason why when you view those like features, it can be really important in the feature engineering step. So for an instance, usually in surveys analysis, prefer not to answer may have like 2% or 3% where you can combine it sometimes with another feature or another answer. But in this case, especially for the outcome, combining prefer not to answer with something else or like not including the prefer not to answer as a feature will mislead your model. The reason why, because most of the people in, your, in the cohort that we have right now, 
answer the prefer not to answer. So if you don't include this as a feature, you're going to have a missing feature or a missing value for around 14% of the participants in the cohort. Now, uh, the next step is, again, we extracted the, uh, like the lab tests, and then we extracted the, this function will extract the comorbidities that were inserted in the participant's record one year before the enrollment. And if you want to use it, once you have access to the featured workspace, you can actually use it or reuse it. What the function will take, you can take a concept uh, identifier list of the diseases that you're interested in. You can pass the concept identifiers and it will return the uh, person identifier, uh, as well as the number of the days or the number of the times that this patient has been diagnosed or uh, like with this disease in the past year before the enrollment. Again, we have like a list of those like different disease concepts and this, this will provide a list of the chronic concepts or chronic conditions that we used in the model. And finally, we extracted the output, which is the active chronic conditions that the patient has been diagnosed with within one year after the enrollment. Again, it's the same function. You can reuse it again in order to extract the data that you want. And like, if you're interested, you can Google and see like what does having uh, command in the SQL equity does because this is a really handy one. And uh, all right, and this one, we calculated like, or like this cell will tell like, uh, in this cell we uh, created which participants had a new chronic disease that has like, or were diagnosed in a new chronic disease uh, within one year uh, after enrollment be, by comparing the number of active chronic conditions before, after enrollment uh, to the before enrollment. Now the second section of the workspace will be about feature processing and engineering which will just like, oh, we're going to create the stats, which is what we said, like the count, the systolic blood pressure counts, the A1C level counts. The same thing, we, we calculate the average value for systolic blood pressure for the creatinine. So all those will like, the notebook will go through different parts of like how you can extract and engineer the features that you have. So each row will be one, uh, will belong to one participants because if the participants have a three values, you can't like in this case, instead of representing the patients using three rows, which can be really misleading for the model, you find a way in order to aggregate the data and the lab values in order to represent or to have one row per participant. And this is will convert the uh, by like the gender, which is the categorical values for the race into uh, into like features that the model can and like the machine learning model will understand. And you can go through this uh, on your own time. Once you have the final cohort again you need to create table one, which is a summary of the cohort because this is going to be really important when you write a paper or even when you try to communicate this to someone else or a collaborators, because that will give you an idea what is the characteristic of your cohort? Is it mainly female? Is it, ma is it like mainly male? Is it ma the majority? Is it white? What is the, what is the diversity of the uh, racial group in your uh, cohort? And you can just like feel free once you have uh, access to the featured workspace to take or like steal kind of whatever like part of the code that you want. Now, we prepared the data set, which is here. We prepared the data set, which is like in the entire data set, we prepared the data set. Now it's ready to be used or like to be passed in the training. The all of us uh, work, the researcher workbench uh, already installed a uh, scikit-learn, which is one of the most commonly used Python packages in order to train uh, machine learning models. And they have varieties of like different machine learning models. And this is like the list of the features that we're going to use. So we divided our data set into 90% that will be used for training and validation, and 10% that will be used in for the test uh, of the data set. And then we divided again or redivided the 90% into two different data set. 10% of that will be used for validation. And 90 out of the 
uh, or like 80%, uh, 90% out of the 90%, which is going to be around 80% will be used for training the model. And yeah, I saved those because like it will be easier to just like sometimes read the files rather than running all the entire workspace. You have the option to save the files into your own workspace and instead of just like rerunning every time and just like wasting 30 minutes or an hour of your like computational time, you can save the, those into your workspace. And there is like snippets that I'm going to um, show you. Like uh, there are snippets that you can use in order to save it into the, your uh, bucket. <clears throat> so this cell, in this cell, we trained a random forest classifier that has 500 trees. Each tree will take maximum 10 features and the maximum depth that the tree will be able to reach is 19 different, uh, is 19 depth. We trained that model and we used it in order to predict the, uh, the, to predict the output, which is whether the patients will have a chronic disease within one year after the enrollment. And we plotted or calculated the AUC value and the accuracy. So the accuracy for this model is around 0.71 and the AUC value is 0.7. It's not good performance because you want your model to be like, to have a higher, much higher accurate, like AUC value, but it's kind of good for the set of features that we have because we have limited set of features and we did not have a lot of features. Now we trained another version of random forest where we passed like uh, where we used 700 trees in order to train the uh, in the random forest the classifier. We used 15 as the maximum depth or like 15 uh, different levels in each of those trees. And the maximum number of features that each one of those trees will be able to use is 13. We trained the model on the training data set, validated the model on the validation data set and again, reporting the accuracy and the AUC value. The AUC value was slightly higher than the first model. We trained another version use, and by varying those parameters. Again, we're trying to find which parameter will help us get the model with the best performance, which is the highest AUC value. And then you can go back and say, well, model two has the best performance overall you can take a look at the top features that help the model provide the prediction. So uh, in random forest, which is one of the neat uh, features about the random forest is that you can get the importance of the features and those features are ranked by their importance or how valuable they were in the prediction when the model was trying to predict the output of the, uh, the output of, uh, or the, uh, the output that we're interested in. Most of them, whether the patient has hypertension, obesity, but when you look down over here, the visits number are an important features. The uh, medication numbers was also another important features. So those two features, let's keep the, especially the visits number in mind because that will help us to understand uh, the analysis that we're going to do next. We also trained like logistic regression. We trained a model where we use like penalty, where we passed uh, like a parameter to train the model. The performance of the model was uh, 0.62, which is lower than the random forest. We trained another model for uh, logistic regression where we passed another model. And the accuracy again was slightly higher, like 0.64, but still it's lower than the random forest. But again, one of the neat concepts or neat things about logistic regression is that you can get the coefficients which describe the linear relationship between the input and the output. And when you look at the top important features that have that are positively correlated with the output, you can see that annual income between, uh, oh, this education, which is like 12 or GAD, is possibly like correlated with like having chronic disease or being diagnosed with a chronic disease after the enrollment. Uh, there is also annual income 10K to, 50, to 115K. There is also the annual income that is less than 10K uh, is also have a positive correlation or like can positively predict or like is positively associated with the outcome or being diagnosed with the uh, 
uh, a, a new chronic disease. Now, when we look at the income or education, we can look at the participants. We can look at the participants' race along with the number of the visits that each one of those participants have, because the visit number was an important feature. Race was not important, but was, what was important is the education. So when we look at the education and look at, again, the visits number, participants who, have, who did not have high school, participants who have uh, GAD had much lower number, like the distribution or even the maximum number of visits was lower than the participants in the other educational categories. When we look at also the income variable, participants who have like uh, 25, uh, like 25K uh, or like between 25K and 35K had also like lower visit. But what was interesting is when you plot the A1C, the minimum value for the A1C versus the income. Participants who have income lower than 50K has like much spreaded range of minimum. The A1C value should be lower than seven. And most of them, especially like the median, which is which, uh, what this violin plot shows is kind of like a little bit higher than the other ones, which tells us like the, those participants who have like low income might have a problem maintaining a minimum uh, A1C. We did the same thing for hematocrat. And again, we saw like the same, you want the, hem the hematocrat, hematocrat to be higher, of course, uh, in those participants. And the wide range like this is like widespread for participants who have less than 10K in the income. All right, I'm going to stop here because I want to leave some time for questions. You feel free to just like play with this workspace that it's going to be a featured workspace tomorrow. Um, you can copy it to your own workspace and just take part of any part of the code or uh, just feel free to just like reuse this code as much as you want. And I will check if there are any questions. Yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask your question or ask it in the question and answer section. You are welcome. Please let me know if you have any questions and feel free to reach out even after the presentation. And again, like you can take this function, the functions that we have over here, reuse it or even change it in order to just like extract the data or like the measurements or expand even the time frame that you want to extract the data from. All right, still giving space for questions, but just gonna make a quick announcement. So as most of you saw in the chat, um, this uh, workspace that Dr. Solomon just showed us will be a featured workspace on the researcher workbench. So if you are a registered user or if you become a registered user, you will have access to, the work, to this uh, notebook. We will also, I, I put a link in the chat to a form where you can fill out if you have already become a, a registered user and we will send you uh, a link to the workspace. So we have one question, uh, is a cohort representative of its corresponding population? So the population that we have, I know for the, uh, from the race perspective, it is representative for the all of us participants because in the all of us in the general cohort, we have around between 50 to 58% of white participants. And in this cohort, the racial distribution was the same. But the 
thing that I've noticed in the income, the cohort that we have right now is slightly different from the uh, all of us participants because most of them did not have a prefer not to answer. Most of the all of us participants in the general population have, I think, the answer, provided answer for that their annual income is less than 10K. Uh, or like most of them, and I think Danielle mentioned this, most of the participants or like the highest percentage is participants who provided uh, responses that their annual income is less than 25K. But the income distribution or the annual income distribution for this cohort was different from the general population. Hopefully I answered your question. And again, you can also compare it to the cohort. So if you have access to a local EHR, or even you can also compare it. One of the benchmarks that sometimes people use is the uh, comparison to the general US population. And like, you can also like have different benchmarks and say like, this has more representation, let's say of uh, black participants compared to the general population of the US. And this is why providing this table one can be really crucial in any paper as well. You are welcome. Any additional questions? Yes, we do. So for one of the uh, random forests, uh, for the random forest model, one of them, the AUC value was 0.7 and the accuracy was around 0.71, if I'm not mistaken. It has given, especially like uh, Jing, given the features that we used or like, the, we only used around mm -hmm. like 86 features in order to predict something as hard as chronic diseases. But was what I was interested in to see if some of those like uh, annual income or disparities in the annual income and education will be important in predicting uh, the uh, diagnosis of the chronic diseases. Uh, okay, there is like a question about how do we access these recordings? Are those sessions recorded, Danielle, or not? Yes, so uh, our aim ahead, uh folks will give you uh, the recording, I believe. I don't know if Sarah or Tom wants to jump on and talk about that. And fair warning, the session will expire after 25 minutes if you're not using the workspace. Just keep that in mind. Sarah, Sarah has responded and she says they're working on the recordings and giving them to you as soon as possible. Omar, uh, Omar the model comparison between Yes, I only included two because it's just like, it's a work featured workspace that it's in a progress, we're working on it. But the reason why I included logistic regression and random forest, because those are the two main ones that more, more like mean, uh, the main researchers usually use in order to predict, and they are considered as the baseline. But you can always use or like train uh, like Adaboost or uh, SVM or support vector machine model. So you can add as many like other models as well in order to compare. All right. Thank you for everyone's um, energetic responses. I think this was really, really helpful to see all of your comments, uh, your questions. Uh, and we will be in touch again. We have that form. Uh, I can put the link in the chat one more time. Um, if you are interested in having the notebook, um, again, even if you are not registered right now, you register later, the notebook will be on the researcher workbench. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email, email us at support at research all of us org. And we're happy to take your questions after this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for staying. Thank you so much for attending this work of uh, this session. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.